Hey, hello and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Where we're trying to bring you the best and the brightest in energy. So today I'm going to start off a little bit different. You know, um, a lot of people talk about diversity and thinking and diversity in all kinds of ways. And most people, when they hear the word diversity, they think of either racial diversity or religious diversity or uh, maybe gender diversity and things like that. But Stan the Energy Man thinks of right brain, left brain. And I guess it's just because I was exposed to that concept back in college and kind of always kept up on it. But for those of you that aren't familiar with the concept of right brain, left brain, it's um, the concept that right brain people are your artists and your nonlinear thinkers and the, cre the creative type people, uh, the dancers and the painters and the Leonardo da Vinci types. And then the left brain people are your, your linear thinkers or your really deep thinkers that, that organize a lot of thoughts and, and make them make sense. They're your Einsteins and your engineers and your, your folks that, that put together complex uh, machinery and make it all work. And when I think of diversity, I think of diversity in, in terms of uh, the job that we do now. I, I think in terms of combining the best of both of those right brain and left brain characteristics when you work on a project. And so today, for, as an example, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about putting together a microgrid. And I, and I want you to think about how this is important in terms of diversity, right brain, left brain. Most of our grids today are, were designed and built by engineers. They were, and they grew over time, or it started off as a fairly simple, uh, you know, power starting here and going to the community, a small community. To the point where nowadays, we have grids that are huge, power generators and huge distributors across wide areas with power coming in from several directions, um, from different uh, power providers on the mainland, they'll, they'll be on other state lines from different sources, like you'll have um, nuclear power or maybe a hydroelectric dam, and then you have uh, solar panels on people's roofs and things like that. So they have become really complex, but they were designed by engineers. But what we're asking the engineers to do now is to think out of the box and design a new grid. And it's hard for them to do it because they're not the kind of people who generally tend to think creatively. They tend to, they solve specific problems. They give you specific answers. They think in very straightforward, like you ask a generator, how do I back up, I mean, a, an engineer, how you back up a grid? And he'll say, a generator. I put a generator on it, a diesel generator. And they're really happy with that answer because they're comfortable with it, it works and it solves their problem, and they're done. They quit thinking about it, they already solved the problem. But if you give it to an artist, they'll go, well, maybe there's other ways you can make. Maybe you could have a wind turbine. Maybe you can have a, an anaerobic digester hooked up to you know, some kind of a power generation. So maybe you could have a flywheel. Maybe you could have you know, this or that, or my favorite, hydrogen. But the best of both worlds is to get both of those brains together in the same room to solve the grid problems of the future, because when I started in, in my job, and I started working with um, one of the electrical engineers that we work with now at Burns and McDonald, it was kind of interesting because I knew nothing about grids and he wasn't very creative. And so when he'd tell me about something, I'd, I'd propose, well, can you solve it this way? And he'd give me this funny look and say, oh, I never thought about trying to do it that way. I, I guess it's possible. He'd do a bunch more homework and find out, hey, we could do some of these things. As a result, we started looking at renewable energy microgrids where he was challenged with a whole new set of, of problems to solve and a whole new set of ways to do things that got him really excited. And that kind of led us into what we're doing at Hickam with the Air Force now. We're trying to build the Air Force a renewable energy microgrid, and that's not a simple thing to do because the grids that are out there today were designed 100 or less years ago. And take power from generating stations and push them out to the community. And unless the utility can control solar panels and things on people's houses, there, there's a point where the grid becomes very unstable with too many people putting things on it. And solving that problem is going to take both right-brainers and left-brainers. So that's how we're going to approach today's show. First of all, I'd like to start off with a video that talks about the kind of grid that the electrical engineer, I, John Botoff, and I came up with to start off on our project. So if we can show that video. There are over 300 million people in our country, and the vast majority rely on large-scale, centralized power grids for their energy. But the infrastructure is aging, and it is vulnerable. 
natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other threats can leave large swaths of the country without power. Fortunately, there is an alternative. A renewable energy microgrid represents a different path for the future. Renewable microgrids generate power from sources like solar, wind, hydrogen, waste to energy, and geothermal. That power can be stored within the localized system using technologies such as advanced batteries, hydrogen, flywheels, pumped hydro, and others. These microgrids can provide reliable and efficient energy transmission, especially to critical facilities like hospitals, airports, and military bases. Unlike our current large-scale systems, microgrids eliminate single points of failure and are therefore more resilient to disasters, threats, and power outages. Our current energy infrastructure loses a lot of money. Grid outages cost up to $33 billion annually. They are expensive to build, expand, and maintain. And they're inefficient, losing more than half of the initial energy to factors such as line loss, spending reserves, and theft. Microgrids solve these issues and greatly reduce transmission loss and maximize efficiency. They also reduce carbon emissions and eliminate imported fuel costs, keeping money within our local economy, and even create new local industries and jobs based on clean, renewable energy. Our energy grid was built over 100 years ago, when energy needs were simple, with the increased complexities of energy demands, power sources, and transportation. Now our old grid struggled to keep up we require new ways to generate, store, and deliver energy. Renewable energy microgrids are a potential long-term solution that will provide safe, clean, reliable, and efficient energy for generations to come. So that was a, a um, video that we had put together here um, at HCAT to explain microgrids as we envision them. And that whole, that product was actually the, um, the baby, the birthing of um, Burns and McDonald's, uh, John Botoff and I, when we thought about how we wanted to make this grid work. We wanted to have lots of renewables, in fact, more than 100% of the, the power required out of renewables, have energy storage, have ways to move the power between the microgrids. So that's something that's really different than the grid that we have today, or even a lot of the microgrids that people are envisioning. Our microgrids are actually gonna be able to shift power from one to another uh, and be able to, to cover each other. So we may have some microgrids with a little bit more energy generation or storage than others that can actually maybe make up one and a half microgrids and they can contribute or collaborate together and provide power, especially when it's critical. So if you can imagine, if you had a, a city that was built on this microgrid concept with, with um, island and separate island and microgrids, if you had a disaster in that city, then all those microgrids could get together and make sure the hospitals and the wastewater treatment plants and the uh, critical infrastructure to keep the city going, the refrigeration for food and things like that could keep operating, even if you didn't have lights in your house and you had to use flashlights. So this is a concept that we're working on um, out at Hickam with the Air Force. And um, my favorite electrical engineer, not that John's not my favorite, he's kind of like right next to this guy, but um, my favorite engineer is Brian Wobbins, and he's on the show today. And Ryan has actually been doing the nuts and bolts on our microgrid and really into the details and helping um, meld the creativity of the HCAT team with um, the engineering skill sets and, uh, and the creativity at Burns & McDonald. So Ryan, thanks for joining us today, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks but, for having um, me again. Yeah, talk about some of the stuff that, that's been a challenge for you as you started the program, uh, working on this microgrid and, and kind of getting your head around what John and I started working on. Sure, the, the neat challenges that we, we come across are <clears throat> where, where the other side, if you want to say the, the artistic minded or the creative minded, are the ones asking the questions and, and pro providing the requirements or the what ifs. Because engineers, are very good at answering problems or answering, answering questions or, or providing a solution to an issue that they're provided. That doesn't mean that the engineer is the best at asking the question or at least asking the question in a matter from a different viewpoint. So when you, when you power up the two and you ask, the, you ask a, a, a different question or a different viewpoint of the question, you're going to get a different solution or a, 
a solution that may not have been provided originally. So that's been the neat start of, of the project. Where, where we started was a lot of distributed generation, keeping um, power flowing between entities and, and keeping that as a dynamic, um, always changing uh, problem. As, as time continues, if you're in a, in a microgrid scenario and you decide, you know, this isn't really my most important place that I need my energy to be placed right now. It actually, at this very instant, my energy is, is, most, uh, is best used in a different location. Now, I'm still within my, my circle, my bubble of influence, but what if I want to change it? And, and think, okay, well, we can do that. We can add some variables in here and change it dynamically. And you say, well, but I don't have enough, you don't have enough power to do that. Okay, well, I got power over there. Why can't you just move it? And then you go back to the engineers like, okay, well, yeah, you, you do have power over there, but here's why or why not you um, can, can move it, so to speak, over to that other location. So the, the questions uh, being asked um, from your side and, and from the Air Force side are great in, in ways of providing an, a little bit different or unique solution on the, on the engineering side. Uh, the, the big questions are, are moving power around dynamically and, and changing that um, as, as time continues. So setting it up at the very beginning is rather simple, but having that change and instantly uh, see that change on the other side um, within an automated system, that, that's been a fun solution to provide. Well, you mentioned automated system. Has one of the solutions or one of the, the um, tools that's helped you solve the problem been the advancement in computers and, and automated switch gear and things like that, have they been able to help you bridge that, um, that gap to be able to adjust the grid and, and changes on the grid fast enough to where the grid can stay stable? Yeah, absolutely. Our, our tools or our arsenal of devices that we can use to provide solutions are, are advancing at, at an extremely fast pace. As the, the world of smart grids is developed and pushed and pushed further and further, we're able to use those components in, in our microgrid because it, we're doing a lot of the same things. You're, you're, in a smart grid, you're, you're providing a lot of capabilities, whether they're automated or manual, but, but they are decisions that are performed remotely to have an impact on a grid. And in a microgrid scenario, it's, it's, it's a lot of the same decisions that you're making. You're, you're using a lot of the same components, maybe a little bit different, maybe your algorithms or, or your logic that you're programming is a little bit different, but the, the components need to have the functionality. That advancement happening in the industry on, on smart grid and, and grid modernization absolutely enables the microgrids to be um, more autonomous and have a lot more capabilities. We could build a microgrid mechanically. It's been done, and it, and it is still done in, in a lot of installations. And there are wonderful machines that are all um, completely autonomous by all mechanical devices. I mean, cars, cars were at one time. Even the, the governor on an engine used to be a, just a, reciprocate, or a spinning device with a couple weights on it. As they, they spun out, you'd change the fuel intake on, a, on mm -hmm. an engine. So, uh, those devices are, are still, and we're made for Freeman microgrid installations all the way down to mechanical relays. But the capabilities may be a little bit less. Um, the, there are safety functions that might be better with some electrical devices. So pulling, pulling from those different pieces of equipment and using them in different ways, having a diverse background in electrical engineering is, is one way to start pulling in those resources. But then you couple it with the, the more creative and, and changing questions. It, it, it starts to create a very neat product. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and be back in 60 seconds. And when we come back, we're going to ask Ryan about um, actually the challenge of balancing a grid and start off with that so, so people understand what the utility has to deal with um, when they have intermittent renewables like wind and solar and things like that. And they have to balance it along with the, just the load changes on their grid from people turning things on and turning them off and big equipment kicking in. But we'll be back in 60 seconds. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. 
You recycle, right? Yep, it's confusing. It's hard for all of us to recycle properly when it's this confusing. Yet recycling is the number one thing we can do for the environment and the economy if we do it properly. We have a solution, and it's working. The standardized labels help people recycle more, and they help people recycle right. Let's recycle across America, and let's recycle right. To be part of the standardized label solution, visit letsrecycleright.org. Hey, welcome back to Snap Energy Man again on my lunch hour, at least for the next month or so. After that, it might be on my own time, which is good because then I can spend more time down here at Think Tech. Maybe I'll even get on the Trump show with, with Jay and those guys and uh, give them some op, op, uh, opposition forces on the other side of the table. Anyway, we got Ryan Wilbins here from Burns and McDonald. And I asked him to start to talk a little bit about the challenge that Hawaiian Electric or any public utility has balancing their grid. Because to most people, that's a big mystery. In fact, I've even had people come up to me and say, oh, that's just a bunch of baloney. The utility's making excuses. But it, it's not. There, there's some serious challenges, especially as we absorb more and more solar power and wind power on our, on our grid. So, Ryan, can you kind of give a, a quick answer, a non-engineering answer <laughs> to the non-engineers out there on how this uh, duck curve and, and power yeah. issues oh, work with the grid? Duck curve, reverse duck curve. We've got a lot of names that we can talk about. But the, the electrical utility grid is the, the most incredible machine of, of last century and this century. It is the most advanced machine that we have. Uh, some could say that, that what the internet has done is a, a machine of its own, but the grid still is, is highly complex and it is a very um, sensitive device where if you were to think of a market, think of like a grocery store where you have a product and you're going to buy a product. From the grid, it's very much the same in the sense that I need a, a kilowatt I'm going to go buy a kilowatt. And at that point, the, the similarities stop. The grocery store has a system of storage. It, it has a place where they're going to, okay, let's bring the product over here and set it down on the shelf, and you can go and consume that product as you want. The grid, it is at all times an instantaneous to the speed of light. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is basically so there's instantaneous. There's a stock putting stuff back on that grid shelf every second. Every, every one sixtieth of a second. Yeah. I mean, it is down to nothing. I mean, for how instantaneous that is, especially for where we're talking here. Um, that, that, is, that exchange, uh, you turning your light switch on, has, a, has an instantaneous request to go buy that extra kilowatt from the utility, and the utility provides that at that instant. Now that you, you get sized enough when you're when you're bigger and bigger and bigger, you can handle these these small variances a, a little bit better. But as you're smaller and smaller, you those dynamic changes, that balancing act becomes even more so critical. So when we're talking these islands, it, it absolutely is a is a difficult uh, equation to balance mm -hmm. out every exact instance uh, in time. And that kind of explains why. When you have an island-wide power outage like we might have here after a hurricane or something, you don't just turn HECO back on and everybody's power comes up right away. <laughs> it's, it's a long process because they yeah. have to bring pieces at a time in until it's stable yep. and then bring the next piece in until it's stable and then bring the next piece in until it's stable mm -hmm. until the whole island's back up. You can't just flip the light switch. And to put it in real basic terms, it's like if we could get everybody to go home and sit there and turn on all their light switches at the exact same instance, that would be a huge problem for HECO. Absolutely. One switch at a time, a couple here and there, not a problem. But if we could somehow synchronize a bunch of people hitting the grid with a power surge at one time, it would be like everybody flushing their toilet at the same time. We could overwhelm the system. And um, in, in some senses, that's what we're concerned about with cyber warfare, is somebody coming in and, and artificially manipulating this, the system and making the power plant believe there's either a big surge or a big drop or a big something mm -hmm. and making those the the whole grid react to it until it actually physically destroys itself trying to keep up with the changes that uh, the cyber guys are saying are happening yeah from a cyber perspective that would be uh, from a cyber terrorism perspective that that's your your goal is to provide that long-term damage um the, that that issue of turning all the lights on at one time you, you have to have this reserve, this very quick reserve, ready to, to give all that power to make that instantaneous transaction happen. That same 
theoretical instance of turning all your light switches on, if everybody had solar on their house at one time, it is the same thing of a big cloud hitting the island. So the, that cloud comes over and, and your solar decides to stop because it doesn't have the sun. It is the, the equivalent of everybody turning their lights on. That's where we start to get these issues where the utility is trying to provide this reserve of energy. It, when I say reserve, and, and yet yeah, I told you it had to happen instantaneously, they are, they are similar. We have a little bit of time where we can start ramping up a generator and provide a, an instantaneous transaction, so to speak. But it, it does create you a little bit more inefficiency in your system. So, sure, because you're running a generator all the time just in case you need it. Just in case you need it, so you can provide that instantaneous. So now that solar that, that everybody put on might cause us to be a little more inefficient. Does that mean that we're going to cost more or less? That, that's, that's debatable in, in another conversation. But uh, that's, that's why that transaction is very important. And, is, and that's why the, the discussion with how much solar can we provide, it's, it's a complicated answer. It's just not time to stop adding solar just to stop it. It's, it's a, a delicate equation that, that needs to um, be looked at as over time. So he's been doing a, a good job of monitoring that. We have the same problem in microgrids. If you want to produce a microgrid with a lot of solar, um, we're, we're the same problem. We're actually that problem where I said we're going from the mainland, providing that instantaneous transaction to these islands, and that's more difficult. And you get to a microgrid, it, it is more difficult as well, but there's a scaling uh, issue where maybe I can know exactly what everything, right. all my power is. Maybe I have more control. I can, it, it costs less to make a microgrid, a, a very modern grid, to make that, that smart grid today. If Oahu was the, uh, extremely modern with all the, the bells and whistles already, which is impractical to think from a cost standpoint, but if it was, it would be a lot easier to, to deal with these changes. So from the microgrid, we, we bring in a lot of um, higher end components, modernize the, the distribution mm -hmm. within, and then you, your capabilities go up, and you, and you start to deal with these issues. So one of the key components there is storage, energy storage. Mm -hmm. So you have to, A, be able to generate the power that you need for that area, but then you also need to be able to cover those surges and, and changes. And then you also have to, especially if you have a lot of solar, at nighttime the sun ain't shining. So you have to be able to literally provide all the power that your customers require at night. If you've got solar, you've got to have some kind of storage. So what are some of the storage options and reaction options that you have that you're looking out of the micro. Sure, so uh, even here at Hickam, we, we have a lot of solar because uh, the return on investment is so great here in Hawaii as far as solar goes. We don't have the sun at night. We, we also sometimes lose the sun during the day. So we gotta be prepared for um, a few different things on an energy storage perspective. We want that short term, um, maybe the cloud hit, maybe we started up a big uh, machine and it's gonna draw a lot of power. We need something right now, give it to me quick. Uh, a generator is great, but we're trying to get to that, that next level of 100% renewable. So when you get to those 100% renewable devices, what's providing you that, that instantaneous, that very short-term energy supply? Um, flywheels were, were in the equation one time to provide that very quick short-term energy boost. Uh, Lithium-ion batteries can be provided to, to provide that very short, quick boost of energy. It depends on the battery chemistry. I mean, lithium ion can be built to be more of a, a deep cycle type as well. So it, how you build your battery and uh, the different chemistries, you can get a very short term or you can get a very long term. Um, when you go to the long term, we've really started to push the envelope on, on what hydrogen can provide for long term energy storage. A microgrid is great for a, a five minute outage, but it, is, it, it can prove life saving if it can go seven days two weeks, 30 days. Um, especially and, here on an island. Especially here on an island. If something were to happen where we can't receive uh, oil or diesel to the island for an extended amount of time, that, that can be very detrimental to, to our capabilities to keep the grid operational. A 100% renewable microgrid in any instance where you're creating and consuming all of your energy within your um, boundary is, is, is incredible. So how do you get to that seven, two weeks, 30 days, 90 days of energy? Well, you're not gonna get it with these short-term batteries. It's, it's gonna prove too expensive. Uh, hydrogen storage is something like 10, 12, 14 times cheaper per kilowatt hour on the energy storage. So we look at a balance for the return on investment. So how much, how much lithium ion battery 
do you want for that short term um, high, high efficiency energy storage? Maybe a cloud hits. Maybe I just want to go through the night. I want to size that battery so much. I don't want to oversize it like an engineer would have a tendency to do because it's very, this is expensive energy storage. Mm-hmm. Sizing that up to, to cover myself will prove expensive. Now, hydrogen you have to, to balance out the short term and, and higher cost energy storage with the hydrogen machine um, where we're talking about electrolysis into a hydrogen production and then a fuel cell coming back out. Cheap KWH or, or time our energy reserve, the, the, I'm not including the, all of the components. A uh, uh, battery has an inverter, not including that. Um, hydrogen has our electrolysis and our fuel. So I'm not, I'm just talking energy storage. When we mm-hmm. scale this, those are minute. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this case, find the, the balance between downsizing your expensive storage and increasing your long-term energy storage and, and prove the, the concept of uh, energy resiliency at 100% renewable. At what do you want? Do you want 30 days of resiliency um, or of energy storage renewable? Uh, you can prove that with bringing together these these different generation assets and these different storage assets. So another another thing that um, actually a lot of folks don't think about when they're when they're talking to the grid or speaking about the grid is, you know, when you do have those fluctuations from solar. Um, but you also have overgeneration from solar. You know, the grid tries to function at a base load where they, they can operate constantly. But sometimes you can actually get too much solar, and it doesn't pay to, to tune the generators down to absorb all the solar. So the electric company will do what they call curtailing. They'll say, all you solar panels just have to stop for now. We, we're going to tune you down and just keep our base load power going the way it is. And then, you know, but that power is wasted. Uh, an, an interesting thing we can do in the microgrid is to take that curtailed power and turn around instantly and make hydrogen, use that fuel or that um, electrolyzer as a load and take all that DC power and put it right into the electrolyzer to make hydrogen. Now you're automatically taking what would normally be wasted power and you're storing it for nighttime or you're storing it for long-term energy and use uh, complementing the energy storage with grid stabilization. So that's something I think that is often overlooked. Yeah, it's, it's a great tool. We use the term stranded assets if we can't go and reach a generation source because it proves too expensive to go get to it and turn it in, uh, add it to um, the, the microgrid or any course. Um, curtailment of solar is the same thing. It's stranded. We, we decide not to have it. It is being provided to us. Hey, you can have all of these kilowatts or these kilowatt hours. You can have them. And when, when you say no and you curtail it, doesn't go anywhere. It just it just turns off. It doesn't come to an existence. You you block it. Um, mm-hmm. Being able to accept it, uh, curtailment's a real issue, and, and you do need it. But you you have the option of curtailing by saying just stop producing it, or hey, instead of go ahead and produce it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make you long term energy storage. If if you have the two available to you, you're gonna put it into your long into your energy bank at that point, and just start. Building your bank account yep. full of I'm all energy. about building my bank account. There you go. And I'm all about hydrogen, too. <laughs> so anyway, that's a, a little look on uh, you know, how we approached our microgrid at Hickam with uh, a little bit of right-brain creativity and a bunch of left-brain engineering. And uh, we think it's a pretty magical combination. And we're hoping that uh, when we finally get it up and running in a couple months, we'll, we'll be able to stand proudly next to it and say, hey, this is a model for not only Hawaii to follow, but maybe a bunch of the rest of the world to follow. So until next week, thanks to Ryan for being on the show, Eric in the control room, and Cindy for micing us up and keeping us uh, all under control. And we'll see you next week on Standard Energy Man. Aloha. 